Welcome to Interdisciplinary Learning, Making Connections. Um, and I've been saying this all day, but every time I think of connections, I think of our brain synapses and how they connect and transfer information and make things happen. And I feel like that's really what interdisciplinary learning provides us is a way to connect to other different avenues and really make meaningful connections and transferring of information for our students. So welcome to this workshop. I hope you guys get something super tangible and usable out of it. Of course, it's hosted by our CREATE team. CREATE team say, hey, give them some shout outs. So whoop, whoop. Uh, they're all here. So feel free to reach out to any one of us. And feel free to tweet, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, all of the, all of the above um, as you're watching, listening, reviewing, or whatever you're doing with us today. Um, and spread the news, spread the news. Like Tiffany said, she was like, hey, this is what TGR is doing today. So keep spreading the news so we can continue to get more and more people involved. Um, as I said, this is our team. Uh, you'll see some of their faces already. But again, we're here to provide uh, professional learning specifically about interdisciplinary approaches, which is very suitable for today, but also inquiry-based and student-centered content that's focused on all of our areas of STEM, college access, and just making real-world connections for our students. So I am your facilitator today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can just call me Jess, but Jess Kessler, I'm your professional development facilitator. My background is in fourth through 12th education and leadership. So I have degrees and certifications in chemistry and educational leadership. And I am excited to jump into our workshop today. Um, just to review our norms, you all are on mute, so gold stars for Zoom etiquette. Uh, but feel free to unmute yourself at any time. We're small in number, so this is really family. So talk to me, guys. Give me that energy. You know I thrive off of it. Love to see your face if you are able to be on camera. Um, and feel free to put any and everything into the chat, no matter what you're thinking, comments, thoughts, concerns, you know, whether you agree or disagree, we want to hear those uh, thoughts in the chat box or even out loud. Again, feel free to unmute yourself as we go. Things you might see today, a chat box, of course, open mic. Feel free to take advantage of, but we'll also be in our breakout rooms today uh, discussing some of the things that we talk about today. So feel free to, again, unmute yourself and show yourself on camera so that everybody can engage with you in that conversation. We'll also have Create Cafe after this workshop, so if you can stay on with us just for a little while after this. Feel free to bring anything that we learned today or anything that sparked up in your mind to that Create Cafe with us so we can go a little bit deeper. Okay, let's jump into our agenda. So first we're gonna talk about what interdisciplinary learning is, of course, giving us a foundation of what this is. Um, we're going to go into how to plan for interdisciplinary learning and just how that planning might look a little bit different from what you already do. Just a couple added steps to get you to that interdisciplinary side. And of course, we always wanna give you guys some resources to take with you so that you can plan and continue to execute these interdisciplinary learning lessons on your own. To start, I really want to frame that this workshop is a uh, partner to our online professional development module. Um, we are going to go over basically high level concepts as far as interdisciplinary learning is concerned. And with this, you're going to notice that there are some gaps. We're going to leave you with some questions. There are going to be some things that we don't have time to discuss, but our online professional development module named right after this uh, workshop is there to dive a little bit deeper into it and gives you an extra 40 minutes to an hour of content on interdisciplinary learning. And in fact, we're going to take some time to look at a few aspects of that digital module um, at the end of this workshop, just to give you guys a little teaser so that you guys can go into it on your own. But one thing I didn't even mention earlier was if you want to share these resources, um, one, we're going to upload this digital workshop to our YouTube channel so you can always share it from there. But if you're willing to do something with your staff or the rest of your team, you can always share our online modules and uh, provide them with those resources to keep going. So highly encourage you, if you have not already, go through that online module, which I'll talk about again later. So. Earlier in the week, and especially for our team, I told you guys we were going to have a special guest. Well, this is our special guest. 
It is our TED Talk presenter for today, and her name is Teresa, and she is going to provide us with a student perspective on interdisciplinary learning. And this was super meaningful to me because we often don't get an opportunity to hear from our students and have them really articulate how interdisciplinary learning has impacted their view on education. And when I found this video of Teresa, I was like, oh my gosh, she hit the nail on the head. I can't wait to share this message and get this out. So we're going to hear from her today in her perspective. Just to give you a little bit of background on her, she was an 11th grader at the time this was shot, but she's now in 12th grade at Sacred Heart Prep um, in San Francisco. And she loves to explore the intersections of science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is one of the ways in which she has done that. So on the next slide, I'm going to start a video quickly uh, that goes into a little bit more about her story. And we would love to hear your thoughts once the video is over um, on what you think about Teresa's perspective. Okay, so first, let me just make sure I have shared everything I needed to share. Cool. All right. And now let's hear from Teresa. I want to introduce to you a new startup, which is completely revolutionizing the employee workflow. I want you to listen to their idea and let me know what you think. Your day would start at 7.50 a.m. and consist of five one-hour meetings, with five minutes in between to walk to your next meeting, which is usually in a different location. You would take mandatory 30-minute breaks at 10 a.m. and at noon. Each meeting would consist of one topic, and these topics would rotate depending on what day of the week it is. I'll let you think for a moment. <laughs> so, would you want to work here? If you can't already tell, this is an imaginary startup, don't worry. And it's one that would never make it. A schedule like this would be utterly ridiculous in any workplace. And yet, this is what school is teaching me to do. What I described to you is exactly what my daily school schedule looks like. Okay, so Teresa just gave us an idea of not only what her daily schedule looks like, but framed it in a way that if this was a job opportunity, who would actually want to take it? So I would love to hear some initial thoughts about um, what your overall thoughts are of Teresa's initial uh, observations are, and or what implications do you think this has for our current classrooms? How are you connecting with Teresa in this video? So feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, of course, you can share out in the chat, but just unmute because we're family. Don't worry, I'll wait. I don't know. I want to hear from Tiffany because I saw an immediate smile on her face when she started <laughs> this video. <laughs> you don't know. I said this too because I, okay, so just for those who don't know me, I have a background in business. So I've worked in a number of careers um, with either NATO C Sparrow, with Missile Procurement, um, Department of Education, with designing websites, um, in the Pentagon, which is the final. And so when I was talking to my sister, who's still at the Pentagon, I said, I've never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> so I understand what it looks like from a, 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 a student's perspective, because when I had to do parent-teacher conferences, and they were 10 minutes, and then the next one, and the 10 minutes, and the next one, and the 10 minutes, and I said I had 20 meetings in one day. And I said, HR would never hire that many employees. And one day, they would have a break. So when, they, when she described this, I like... Like, I was like, I'm glad that a student is trying to bring to life what I believe is a system that needs to be adjusted so that it's for the betterment of the whole group, the community, the students, the parents, and the teachers. Love that. Thanks, Tiffany, for sharing out. Thanks, Holly, for throwing her in there. <laughs> Anyone else like to share out their, their thoughts of Teresa and her perspective? Um, sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, so one thing I noticed was when she was talking about the changing meetings, um, at no point do, did they, um, did she talk about how they're using what they learned in the meetings? Like there, there's no application. They're just 
like a revolving door of meetings and topics, but there's no application, no connection, anything. Exactly, right? And if either of us, you know, got this job offer in the mail for this startup, like, hey, your day will consist of, you're like, oh, what, do, what will my day look like? You'll go to five meetings every day for like an hour, then you'll have a lunch break, then you'll go home. You're like, what? I'm not doing that job. That sounds horrible. Um, but this is the reality of our students and our education system. And of course, we can all agree that there's a systematic change that needs to happen in education. But I wholeheartedly believe that those changes don't, don't come unless we individually take a stand in our classroom and show people what this could really look like and how we can make a difference here. So with that being said, and it is, let's look at the definition of interdisciplinary learning. So from the CREATE team, this is our definition, our CREATE team definition. And we have defined this as examining an issue or topic from multiple perspectives or disciplines in order for students to acquire a deeper understanding that will help them either create a solution to those problems or that will replicate a real world scenario. So to use a, a little graphic that I put together, we start off with this really complex problem, right? COVID-19, uh, pollution, uh, a world crisis, or something super complex, and we allow students to think about, okay, what, what's the math connection? What's the ELA connection? What's the science connection? What are all the things that work together that will allow me to understand this issue better and bring to the forefront a solution that will help pinpoint all of those different areas in something uh, super actionable. And for us, what this means is having that uh, complex problem or even topic of study, right? So like uh, energy and chemical reactions is a complex thing. It's something that is a, a big lofty thing for students to understand. So what are those math components I can bring in or technology? What's the art that I can bring in to help them understand it a little bit better and on their level so that they can start to break down all of the different pieces, okay? So with this kind of thinking in mind and this graphic here for us to think about, let's hear a little bit more from Teresa to get a little bit more understanding of her perspective of how this interdisciplinary exchange works. Ovarian cancer runs in my family. In other words, I am predisposed to it. And this is a reality that I live with every day. So this past summer, I did some research on preventative measures that I could take. And in the process, learned that there's no easily available screening for ovarian cancer. Too many cases are caught too late. So this year, I proposed an independent research project for a course called Independent Inquiry at my school, Sacred Heart Prep. My project aimed to use R, a statistical programming language, to analyze ovarian cancer from NIH's Cancer Genome Atlas project. My goal was to identify key genomic factors that determine the severity of ovarian cancer. At the beginning of the year, I identified that my project has three main subject areas, biology, statistics, and computer science. If I were to take on this project in a traditional classroom environment, that would mean I would be taking three different classes and have no time to make the connections between the subjects. Instead, this year, one of my periods was devoted to interdisciplinary learning. And I not only learned more deeply about each of the subjects individually, but also was able to connect them. I learned how to import biology data into R. I learned how to interpret the results of my code in terms of statistics and biology. I learned how to find the needed packages of code to run the statistical models I wanted to. All of these are skills I could not and would not have learned in a traditional school environment. So with this added piece from Teresa about her independent project, how does her story compare to maybe your school setup or have you thinking about the way in which you offer maybe your program or classes or whatever the case may be. Love to hear a couple share outs. I can go ahead, Jess. Thank um, you. And I think um, looking back to uh, when I even set up my classes, um, I think I'm still guilty of 
having that one track thinking of like, okay, if this is about uh, science, like marine science, then it can only be about marine science and it has to be, you know, within those parameters. But I think the way she described it, like if she was going to separate them into classes, she would have to take three different classes. And that's not really how like the reality is, right? Because it is interdisciplinary. It takes um, from everything. So I think that's a good representation or a good um, analogy, I guess, to kind of show you how kind of uh, ridiculous it is how we split it up. Um, and I don't think it's anyone's like specific fault, right? I think um, just how we were brought up, even me as a student brought up, that's what I learned. I do math and math, I do English and English and science, science, and you know, you can't mix them, but that's what brings creativity is mixing them together. So I think it was a really good analogy that she brought up. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely, because this is the way we've all learned, right? At some point or another, we've all learned this. And it was super interesting because Gaila in our first workshop today said, hey, the first thing, one of the first things that we did in our certification program was learn how to make a thematic unit, right? And I did the same thing. I learned how to create a thematic unit and it was on alchemy. And as soon as I got in the classroom, they were like, yeah, we're not doing those themes anymore, those bigger problems, just teach chemistry and just do this and, and teach them so they can pass this test. And I was like, what? Okay, well, that's the job, you know. But I think we're at a great uh, pinnacle in our educational um, uh, system right now where we're acknowledging the fact that that does not work and it only works for the test but does not work for career preparation. Anyone else? Um, I wanted to say when I was teaching fourth grade, um, since they had me teaching all subjects, I would, it would always be a project. I was like this, okay, now we're doing, and it would be like you're doing some research and now we're doing some history. Um, you created your own books. It was always some type of project that brought everything in. I'm now homeschooling my oldest son and we were doing some science and uh, we were talking about the snow owls back in 2014. And um, he was like, wait, we're doing math. I said, I know, they're married. So I need you to fill out these coordinates and tell me where these owls went. <laughs> so we're covering like both. I was like, this is not one topic and one subject. This is the world. The world is not in one silo. You go outside, you're experiencing math, science, you're experiencing some type of history, you're experiencing all these things. So I'm actually trying to reform my son's brain now to think this is all connected and is and if you don't know some of it then some parts are going to lack so you need to actually be careful with the information you've been giving because it's all very useful i love that i love the fact that you mentioned that you're reprogramming his brain because we also have to reprogram our brains right we get so used to this that not only does it become a hardship for us teaching it, but it becomes a hardship for students to be open to it, right? They're like, what are we doing? Like, this doesn't make sense, right? And it actually makes the most sense, right? But because we're so used to doing it a different way, it starts to derail us. And I think Holly said something about that earlier, about how primary um, schools have the biggest benefit, right? Because they teach all the grades so they could just, you know, keep doing this interdisciplinary learning and yet they still say, okay, 20 minutes of science, 20 minutes of math, 20 minutes, even though they're with the kids all day and can easily start to bring in all of these different groups. So I appreciate that. I'm seeing some comments in the chat about collaboration with subject teachers is very important. Absolutely. Uh, honing those relationships with your peers is definitely useful through this kind of method. Um, using those teachers who have other expert, expertise outside of your range is definitely going to expand your uh, ability to, to be interdisciplinary. Um, and those real world connections, right? The, or the application, the topic transcends different content areas, absolutely. And that's why we wanna start with something that is complex because if it's simple, right? If it's too small, then your students are gonna be like, oh, one, I'm gonna be done super fast, but two, they're not gonna see the the, the value of all the other perspectives. So love those comments. Which brings me. So based on what Teresa laid out for us, her schedule basically had no common ground. There was no anchor really drawing her content together. She would have been learning biology by itself, then going to statistics, learning that by itself, and then going to computer science by itself. She would go home and have nothing to connect these things together. 
But because she started with, I want to learn about this, um, this super relatable, something that was in her family that she could be predisposed to. She said, I want to learn this and I need to incorporate all of these things to understand what's happening. And what really is powerful for me is that she is probably the one student who said, I want to learn more about this, but think about all the other students who don't have that kind of stamina in them to say, hey, I want to learn this and who are kind of just like, if my teacher says this is how I learned, then this is how I learned, right? So we have the opportunity to create the space for everyone so that every student can take advantage of this and not just that one student who has that gumption to say, this is how it should be. So some additional benefits that, uh, interdisciplinary teaching and learning brain is, of course, addressing more than one standard at once, right? We always have one standard at mind to start with. We're like, okay, I got to teach balancing chemical equations. It's just one standard, but through interdisciplinary learning, I can have that, I can have an algebra standard, I can have an ELA standard, I can really be hitting a lot of different targets at one time. Connecting content related to complex problems, opportunity for students to do the driving of the learning, especially when they're giving a problem that is relatable to them that they can understand. They're going to be the ones who take the wheel and say, I got this, let me go and investigate this and figure out what I learned. And then they'll start using you as the resource rather than the keeper of knowledge, right? It replicates research and career fields and it reinforces those skills. We know this for a fact, we're all in a career where we have to use all of our skills all at once, right? We're juggling 15 different things at once, all these different skills. Um, and we need to be teaching our students how to do that. And that can be done through this kind of interdisciplinary learning. So I want to give you guys a few statistics that came out of the 2018 Job Outlook Survey, and I would love to hear your thoughts on how you think these statistics really relate and, and resonate with you. So the first one is that 60% of employers believe that recent college graduates lack critical thinking skills. The second is that 90% of recent graduates believe that they are super prepared for work. They come out of college like, yes, I am ready to go to work today and I'm going to kill it. And then only 50% of their employers actually agree that they're actually ready for the workforce and for their career fields. So I'm going to stop there. No context. Just what are your thoughts and how do you think this relates to our topic of interdisciplinary learning? Give you some time to take it all in. Um, I think there's a huge disconnect between the education system and the workplace. Um, if there's a 40% gap, um, something isn't lining up and we need to look back at that. Absolutely. Just kind of adding on to that, I think a lot of um, the younger students, um, there's Google now. So if you can look something up real fast, um, it kind of feels like you know a lot, right? And you can do um, a lot with that, but the they don't really know how to apply that knowledge or just like it says, the critical thinking skills, things like that um, might not necessarily be there, but I think just the fact that that instant gratification is um, so close to them right now. Um, I think that the, I don't know how to word it, but just like the critical thinking skills are definitely lacking. For sure. Thank you for that. I'm seeing in the comments, learning in isolation doesn't provide students with the opportunity to think critically. And it doesn't, right? They're just learning, they're just absorbing information. They're not using it, applying it in really uh, critical, crucial, and complex ways, right? If you teach a kid how to balance an equation and then just say practice 50 of them, how are they learning critically or applying that to a, a, a complex problem? Um, so they don't know what they're really using it for. Go ahead, Ms. McCoy, you can uh, jump in there. Um, okay, so um, when you started talking about interdisciplinary, I was, not confused, but um, my school is an IB school, uh, International Baccalaureate. So 
the vocabulary I'm used to is transdisciplinary. And so my, I was like, well, what's the difference? So I actually Googled it because I was like, what is the difference? Um, and uh, I know that for my students, um, we'll give them a concept, right? Um, uh, one of the first ones we did at the beginning of the year was scarcity. Mm -hmm. And they had to apply it um, across different content areas. Um, and they, they made connections through COVID. So there was scarcity um, with the toilet paper, um, cleaning supplies. And, um, and now, you know, when we were talking about fresh water and, and water, um, which is a fifth grade standard, uh, they were talking about scarcity of fresh water and how people should behave because there's a scarcity. Um, and they noticed that wow, we use water for a lot. Like we water our grass. Why are we watering the grass? You know, um, brushing our teeth, wash your hands, all this all the time. Whereas other living things don't necessarily use as much fresh water as we do. And they were saying that it was being greedy, which was, they related it back to COVID and people taking more toilet paper than they needed. Um, so they were able to make these connections based on like one concept, having one concept. And, and now they're like that word scarcity, they'll never forget it because uh, mm -hmm. they've, they've applied it to their real lives. Um, but I'm still like, <laughs> I read the definition for interdisciplinary and I was like seeing the difference. Um, and so I just, I don't know, I'm still trying to <laughs> figure out. No, I'm glad you brought that up because what you just described is like students being able to take one topic or subject and in each one of their classrooms being able to bridge the gap to that one topic. In interdisciplinary learning, we're talking about one classroom having this complex problem and in that one classroom being able to address it from different perspectives. So more along the lines of the trans uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary is more like cross-curricular, right? Where every teacher is aligned in their ability to be able to bridge the gap to that topic. In this one, you are in your classroom and you might not have other teachers that are working on the same topic, but you're still able and willing to give them those different perspectives in your sole classroom. Um, so interdisciplinary um, is great, especially at primary, super accessible because they have those kids all day and can really uh, manipulate and bring all those topics together. It might be more challenging at the secondary level, but it's definitely possible because the complex topics are still there and even more challenging for students to access, which is great because it means that they'll have more to bring to the table. Um, it's just about how do you do that and when do you do that. So love that you brought that up. And caveat, throwing it over to our online module, it actually talks about the difference between cross-curricular and interdisciplinary, um, which you can relate to the one that you're using and then see what those commonalities and differences are. So I love that. Awesome. And thank you, David, for also adding in the diagram to show some of those differences. <laughs> All right, so as we keep going, um, I wanna talk about planning interdisciplinary lessons. And the first two steps are really common. This is what every teacher does anytime they plan any lesson or any unit, right? First you talk about, okay, what's my focus for today? What's the standard? Okay, so what's my objective? What do I wanna have students do? Um, what we often don't take the time to uh, get into is actually considering the other disciplines or focuses that could relate to that topic. So as Andres was saying earlier, you know, he's like, you know, we're in marine science, I focus on marine science, right? And sometimes we don't give ourselves the time and the space to say, well, you know what? What kind of music or how could music be engaged in this? How could technology be used in this? How could art be used in this? How could, you know, industrial design be used in this? Or whatever the case may be, and really take the time to explore what other content areas could provide support for driving home this topic. So I know I want students to balance equations, but there's a lot of algebra in that. What are some other ways in which I can address that topic with some of these other things that will really help them understand what's going on? And then prioritizing the activities, because if you do that, if you consider other disciplines, 
you'll have a list of like seven different perspectives that you can take this from, different opportunities to really dive into this. And of course, you don't have all the time in the world to go through every single last one and say, you know, we're going to do 45 lessons on balance and equations and because we want to make it interdisciplinary. You got to learn how to prioritize which two to three are going to be the most impactful for the students and really get them that deeper understanding that you want you're still trying to drive them towards your objective. So you never want to lose sight of what your objective is. You just want to give them other perspectives in which to access it. And that is a part of the, the, the larger complex issue. And then you'll keep going as normal. You'll plan your assessment like you always do. And you'll plan your lesson sequence, like first we're going to engage, second we're going to explore, explain, or whatever uh, framework that you use to plan your lessons. So really here, the, the difference between maybe your traditional lesson or what you're used to doing and trying to increase the interdisciplinary aspects of a lesson is just taking the time to say, what other lenses could students look through in order to understand this concept? So with that being said, we're actually going to take a look at an example. Okay, so this could go on, it could look different ways. I know everybody has their own way of planning lessons, but we've kind of, I'm just gonna skip over real quick. We've kind of just laid out the steps in kind of a simplified way that hopefully is easy to understand. But we are gonna provide you with a copy of this lesson. And we want you guys to get into groups and into teams and think about, you know, how could this approach be used for your instructions? What questions do you have? what could you take away from this model and just your overall thoughts on these six steps to planning an interdisciplinary lesson okay with that being said david has put that sample lesson into your comments so you can just click on it and a pdf should come up in the google drive and you guys will get into groups of three or so and be able to talk through what you observe what do you notice and all those other things that i've just posted there any questions about what you're doing in your breakout groups? Let me get a thumbs up on screen if everybody is good to go. Awesome, 100% thumbs up. Um, awesome, and David is also adding the questions that are on the screen into the chat so that you guys can reference them in your breakout groups. So whenever David is ready, feel free to whisk everyone away and you'll have about 10 to 15 minutes in order to have this conversation with your, with your group. But welcome back, everyone. I would love to hear your thoughts. What were some of the things you guys were talking about while you were in your groups? What were some of your overall thoughts of this planning and just wrapping your mind around this interdisciplinary approach? Give it to me out loud in the chat. Whatever you got. I can go first. Um, so our group talked about how um, I think most of us in our group, we were already trying this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary wow, I can't believe that, um, style of uh, when we were creating our curriculum. Um, but we were also talking about how to kind of explicitly um, show the students that they are learning all different disciplines. So for example, we were talking about how students might think like, well, I'm a science person, so I don't need to know how to write, or I'm a math person, so I don't need art. Um, but when we have a lesson like this, um, they might be um, touching upon all different disciplines without even realizing it. Um, so how do we make them realize that actually, you think you're a bad writer, but you just wrote about something that you're really passionate about um, without knowing? Um, and it wasn't in that English class where they had to write an essay about a book, but they still incorporated their writing skills. Um, so we were saying, how can we kind of um, show the students that they are capable of doing all different things and real life is like that? Um, and do, do we explicitly say that or are there different ways? So that was kind of leading into my question as well. How do we... Um, make the students realize that they are actually learning all different disciplines at the same time. I love that. And I love that question because I feel like that's the question students have. Like, one, they'll ask it in the, why are we learning this in this class, <laughs> right? Um, 
But I think by framing it in the context of something that complex problem allows them to see you can't solve the pollution problem only looking at this from the science, right? You can't, you can't solve that problem without thinking about the money, without thinking about the time, without looking at the resources, without thinking of, like you can't, that problem is unsolvable without all the other things. And I think by showing them that, if you pose a problem and say, okay, I only want you to solve this problem with math and see how many people can actually figure it out. Does that solve everything? And I guarantee we'll always come up short because those problems are too large to think with one eye, right? And so when we show that to them, I think it's better than explaining it to them because when we explain it, it's just another thing we're explaining rather than them being able to actually explore it on their own and really see how it works together. So I love that. And I definitely think that's where we can model and let the students really drive a lot of this, this practice and how we frame it, right? Not being afraid to also let them fail in the process. Because if you pose that question and let them do it, knowing they're gonna fail, our teacher instinct is like, oh no, let me get them before they, they fall too far. No, let them do it and let them feel what it feels like to not get the answer. And then realize that, oh, because if you actually think about this, like give them the opportunity to have those aha moments. And then uh, like Ms. McCoy was saying, they'll never forget what that is now because they have seen it and have felt it and they'll have heard it and they'll, be using all of their senses to, to really drive home that point. Love that. What else, what else, what else? What else did we talk about? What else did we say, yes? Um, uh, so Andres in our group was talk, uh, telling us about a lesson plan that he had done with his students. And he um, said that he didn't know how, he didn't have a background in math, so he didn't know how to relate math back um, to the topic. And I think it was astrology. Um, so we said, you know, like collaboration is really important and maybe meeting with a math teacher who can help you make that connection. Absolutely, use your peers, right? Because especially at a secondary level, like I have a degree in chemistry, I can chem up and down the streets all day long, but I don't have a degree in how to teach kids how to appreciate math. I can do the math, but I don't know how to break it down for them all the time, right? So I'm always going to a math teacher saying, hey, how did you teach the kids this? And what would be the best way for me to approach that with them? Because, you know, it's strength in all of our expertise. Um, so yeah, definitely using those collaborations. One more, I see in the chat, majority of students struggle with word problems as it involves closed reading to understand and solve. That is a key prime example and kids just you know one we always struggle with reading that's just one of the things our entire universe right now is struggling with but understanding how math and reading go together is the challenge right number one recipes or things like that like bringing in those other approaches and making it a com more complex problem than just read the paper and solve the math problem but how about you have to solve this cooking problem. You have to bake this cake for a birthday. Like, how do you figure this out? Brings it down a little bit more. Fantasy people, love that. I want to say real quick, <laughs> on that um, kind of word problem uh, question, I think, you know, students always kind of dread reaching towards the end of their homework assignment because you have those two word problems back, you know, in the traditional text. And I think it's the, the, the probably the challenge is the scaffolding, right? So they do a series of, um, very specific skills in terms of solving an equation all of a sudden boom they're hit with this this big question that requires a, a some logical thinking some maybe applying some of the concepts that they've learned so perhaps even building a kind of a, a better scaffold to have them reach that versus kind of having them feel like they're hitting a wall of text basically is when they see these word problems right so yeah i think you know there's lots of ways to bring those connections together but sometimes you know uh, it's even just highlighting the words that they don't understand right this goes back into some of the language arts and those abilities and skills to um to die to um yeah to comprehend and understand that, that problem so i love uh, uh, i'm loving these uh, comments and how often do we ask them you know draw it out like the words are trying to illustrate a point or a picture. Draw it out. Take some time to and include that art perspective, right? Or that music perspective, those other things. 
Love it. All right, let's keep going because we're almost at the end of our time together. So as I said before, um, we have a online PD module that goes even deeper into this. And I just want to share it really quickly. I know some of us are probably already familiar with it. But for those of us who are not, when you go to our TGR EDU Explore page, there is a professional development tab. And under that tab, you're going to see, oh, look, a familiar face today. You're going to see some learning modules. These are self-paced uh, professional development modules. Um, right now, there are three available and more to come, definitely more to come. And the one that is partnered with this is Interdisciplinary Learning Making Connections. Uh, when you click on it to explore, it's going to bring you to this page for you to start your learning module and just sign up. I already have an account, so once you get in, it looks like this. You can start the course, which only takes about 40 minutes, but in this course, you're going to get more about the difference between cross-curricular and interdisciplinary, more about uh, practices or ways you can implement this. It'll take you through some examples of how to plan for but one of the great things is that it also has this takeaway, which is how to plan one. So there's going to be a guide that you can download, that you can share, and that you can use over and over again among the other resources here that will allow you to actually put this into practice. So you got to go through the module to get the guide, the extra, the extra resources. So that's the carrot that I'm going to string in front of you to make sure that you go and actually take the module share it give it to your peers um go over with your admin just share it as much as possible so that everybody can get some of those resources and i would love to share with you guys a video of one of the professionals that we featured in that video and her name is rupal and she has the coolest job ever working with optics for the military um and here's what she said about interdisciplinary learning in her career field Anytime I'm doing anything in the lab, it's always uh, interdisciplinary work. You know, understanding not only the optics side of it, but also the mechanical and electronics, and you know, even a little bit of programming. I'm absolutely applying all these disciplines at the same time, whether I'm conscious of it or not. And that's how the real world works, and that's how real engineering is. And so, having you know experience in the classroom that replicates that will only set the students up for more success in their real world jobs. And that was literally a 10 second bite of the longer video that she gives where she really breaks down her job, what she experienced in school and how she brings that back to really appreciating interdisciplinary learning and wishing that she had more opportunity in school to explore it in this way. Um, which I think all of us do. I think even in my case, uh, similar to hers, I really set out to do one thing with my life and then realized that it's not what I wanted to do at all. And had I had more opportunities to explore, especially in an interdisciplinary way, I probably would have came to this realization of education a lot sooner than I thought. <laughs> and so similar to her story. So this might even be one of the things that you share with your students, this video to show like these are professionals um, and how they reflect on their education experience and how valuable it is to kind of have this now instead of waiting for later. So just some quick common misconceptions that we have and just addressing them with some realities. Um, it's often a misconception that interdisciplinary lessons take too much time. And I know time is a factor for all of us. We never have enough of it and it's always wasting away. But timing is definitely dependent on you. When you make your list of like, these are 15 different activities kids can do with all these different lenses, choose those top three. What are the three that are gonna make this lesson impactful for the students and drive it home? If you only have a week, then only choose one or two of those activities. If you have a unit a month, then you can fit all of this stuff into the time that you have because you're still trying to reach that same objective, but you're just doing it using some other lenses that will definitely deeper the understanding for the student. Um, the other misconception is teachers must be content experts. And like we heard earlier, it's about collaboration. Uh, one, you and your students can learn together and discover together, and there is no fault in them being able to take the reins in some of those other areas. Um, but using your other peers definitely helps to strengthen where you might feel weaker. 
Um, and something that someone brought up earlier, which I think led or stemmed from David's comment in one of his groups, was that you could take this step by step, right? We're not expecting you to flip your classroom tomorrow into this 100% interdisciplinary approach for every single class and every lesson. But it's about what's that one thing that you can introduce? What's that one idea that you can post to your students to help get that ball moving in the right direction. So you don't have to be an expert in, in geometry in order to introduce a small topic to them just to give them that new perspective to help them deeper that understanding. And if they have more questions, great. We always feel like we're never going to be able to answer those questions, so we're not going to dig into it. But the more questions they have, the better off they're going to be because that's where they take the reins to explore and figure out those answers. And it is okay for teachers to say, you know what, I don't know, let's figure it out together or you guys go ahead and research it and bring it back tomorrow. Um, another misconception, you need co-planning time. Co-planning time is amazing. It would be great if we could all have co-planning time. But interdisciplinary learning is designed for one teacher to really take the lead on this in their classroom. Having the insight of other teachers is only an added bonus, but you can definitely do this in your own um, space. And students have the opportunity to do this in other spaces, so why do you need to do it in your class? Uh, this might be true. There might be some teachers who are already doing this and you feel less pressure, but got to tell you that by having this experience in more than one class, um, like we heard earlier about having all the teachers on the same page and everybody's doing their part only prepares students even the more and allows them to reinforce those skills in multiple settings that are going to be super useful uh, for their kids. So any thoughts, comments, or reflections on some of these misconceptions slash realities that I presented? Let me go over to the chat. Love it, one step at a time, absolutely. Do not try to flip your classroom overnight. It will not work and everybody will have a bad day. <laughs> so one step at a time, one small nugget at a time, one bite at a time makes a, a huge difference. I just wanted to share something that, that Jason brought up in an earlier session and I loved hearing it um, and really thinking about how, you know, interdisciplinary learning um, isn't just for, you know, the high achieving students. This is an opportunity to reach those that might not see those initial connections that you might bring. Um, and, you know, when he shared that, I was just thinking when I was teaching game design, this is a prime example of when my students just have some, just feeling a little disconnected with the, the programming, but highly engaged with the graphic design and with the story writing, right? And so empowering them to kind of uh, build those connections with another student to develop and collaborate together. So then becomes these real world skills. So I think really find those opportunities to connect, you know, you know, first obviously figuring out what your learning objectives are, but um, you know, enabling those students that might seem initially disinterested or maybe have that have that initial kind of like um, a stigma, like if they're not a math person, right? They have to overcome that eventually, but perhaps they might be able to see that they are a math person by, you know, insert this subject here, right? Love that. Um, thank you for bringing that back up. Thank you, Jason and Spirit. He's not able to make it to this evening, but he's definitely here with his comments. So um, with that, I'm not gonna hold this any longer because we are two minutes past the hour. So I would love for you guys to give me your key takeaways, but you can give them in the chat or you can give them on the survey that we're going to send out after this um, so that you guys can give your feedback and any takeaways from today. I will let you know that coming up next in January, we're going to be talking about aligning objectives with your inquiry activities. Alignment is so important because the reason why some of our assessments come out poorly or we feel like students aren't getting it is because there's some kind of misalignment somewhere. So we are going to break that down and I am going to be leading out that workshop as well. So come back and join me in January after the holidays so that we can talk about alignment and it's actually going to be the first of a two-part series on alignment we're going to talk about aligning the objectives with the activities first and then aligning the assessment because this creates a strong lesson plan and gives you the results that you're looking for so i look forward to seeing you guys then uh, of course we'll send you an email with all of those links for you to register and to share feel free to stay on for a few minutes and create cafe if you want to continue the conversation or visit any one of our mediums, including our Explore site, our foundation page, or our YouTube page um, in order to gain access to any of our amazing resources in our other videos. And with that being said, thank you guys so much. I'm just reading the chat. 
Thank you guys so much for joining us uh, on a, what's today? Wednesday? Wednesday evening slash afternoon. Uh, and I hope to see you guys next time. Enjoy the rest of your week.